Hi everyone, I am Karina Broto Heboli and I am a PhD student. Today I will interview Dr. Yuna May O'Reilly. She leads the N-Scale Learning for All, the Alpha Group at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Dr. O'Reilly has worked with evolutionary computing since the 90s with important contributions for the field in the technical and human sides. She founded and she's chair of many groups like the ACMC EVO. She won, she's one of the founders of the Species Society and she inaugurated the Humans Group in the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference. So thank you for being with us, Dr. O'Reilly. It's a really pleasure to be with you having this interview today. It's my pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would like to start asking to you uh, to tell us about your current work. Which are the main or most exciting projects in which you are working and how evolutionary computing techniques are used on them? Well, my current interest is in adversarial intelligence. And what I mean by that is I'm interested in how adversaries um, compete and engage, whether in games or in warfare or in hopefully uh, less, more mundane competitions. And I'm interested in how they learn from experiencing those competitions and how those competitions proceed um, as they learn. So that's really um, a phenomena that takes place all over in the world. Um, and it's very co-evolutionary, right? We often see populations of um, competitors. We might see the classic uh, hares and foxes. Uh, we might see uh, simply an animal trying, struggling against its environment and trying to survive. And what evolution has done, ha it sort of has worked as this very intelligent, it's not it's not an intelligent process, but the process of, of evolution has given rise to all these intelligent solutions to competitions and adversarial circumstances that organisms face. So taking inspiration from that, I work a lot with coevolutionary algorithms, uh, in particular competitive coevolutionary algorithms, where we look at the dynamics of coevolutionary processes, and we also think a lot about uh, how we represent members of the population and how they uh, um, strategize and compete with each other. Really nice. <laughs> Thank you. And because they are like the, also another level of the evolutionary relationships between uh, solutions. So it's almost like another another level of the evolutionary computing algorithms. Really, really interesting. And it's also related with um, something that Koza has said in his uh, talk in the last Gecko, that we always should be, uh, should remember to be inspired by nature. So it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> right, and, and com competitive algorithms like we build with evolutionary computation, uh, they're not the only competitive algorithms in machine learning. Um, and that's what's mm -hmm. interesting is there's this parallel to generative adversarial networks in deep learning. Um, and I love the fact that there's connections between sort of uh, the evolutionary learning community and the machine learning community uh, per se with, with generative modeling. <laughs> yeah, quite interesting. Nice. And well, in science, generally speaking, there is this spectrum in which one side we have uh, the research driven by applications and on the other side the research done to generate knowledge or to advance one field without thinking on how the results of that research will be applied. Uh, of course both are important and should be done uh, but y are you uh, more oriented towards applications or pure research? And how do you see this balance in the field of evolutionary computing? Uh, it's such an interesting question. Um, it's not so much that I have a preference between applications and fundamental research. 
I think that I have um, an outlook and sort of a mental way of approaching problems that makes me more um, applied. And, and I think it comes from being somewhat of an engineer. Um, engineers solve problems. Uh, scientists investigate knowledge. And I might call myself an engineer more than I would call myself a scientist. Um, but I think the evolutionary co computation community is extremely fortunate because it's very um, easy to work on fundamental problems as well as to use applications to guide understanding our algorithms better and improving our algorithms. So we're in this really, really nice um, niche where um, good work gets done, whether it is fundamental in research or it's um, driven by an application problem. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. Nice uh, comparison between the engineer and the scientist. Uh, I think that's right. Great. And I think I think our community. You asked about our community. I think our community is composed of very um, broad and diversely skilled uh, yeah. people. And so we have our engineers and we have our scientists. We have yeah, people because nice. of their love of biology and evolution to the field, and we have people who came with very practical. Um, search it, you know, practical ambitions when they arrived. Um, I think there's also a spectrum in the evolutionary computation community between people who do empirical research, where, which means they sort of, they develop new algorithms, they uh, apply new algorithms, and they do a lot of empirical testing and evaluation of them and assessment of them. Um, and that's at one side of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum is the theoretical work that gets done. You know, and I have great respect for the people who do theory in evolutionary computation because it's hard it's really really hard theoretical work we um, have an extremely complex algorithm and um, it takes great ingenuity for theoreticians to find um, the correct abstraction abstractions of our complex algorithms that they can then uh, make some progress with yeah, so yeah. I, I wish yeah. i could be i kind of have theory envy um <laughs> a little bit um i kind of have fundamental Kind of, I'm always envious of people who go after fundamental scientific knowledge, uh, but I think in the end, one goes in the direction where you're well suited. Or, um, and I think I'm suited to be an engineer and, and sort of solve problems. Okay, nice. And I got to know that your first experiences on uh, programming were not let's say successful uh -huh. would you like to tell us how it was and what made you to overcome that difficulties well, well that's a great question i took up programming uh, for the first time when i went to college as a first year college student um in the u.s you'd call me a freshman um and you know that's an incredibly uh, challenging year for anyone Right, moving from the high school curriculum and the high school environment to the university environment is already asking um, a lot of a person. And I decided to take a computer science programming course, um, mainly motivated by this um, observation that a lot of people with computer science uh, programming skills uh, could get great jobs. You know, that's what I was thinking about when I was 19. And so I signed up for this course. Um, and what I found was the lectures were very understandable. I, I understood what the professor was doing in the lectures, but when uh, an assignment was given to me and right out of nowhere, I had to come up with a program. I found that so hard. Um, and it took me an entire term to really master um, how to program. And each with each assignment, I learned another set of skills and I think it was really this total obstinacy to failure. There was no way I was going to give up. I'm not a person who uh, gives up easily. Uh, nice. There was this demand of myself to to have confidence in myself that if uh, if I looked around and my peers could do this, even if I was struggling with it, I could figure it out for myself. Nice. And then, luckily for me, I was just like spurred by the by the passion I have for the, 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 the for programming, 
Programming is awesome. Programming <laughs> is this way of describing how to do something. Um, and you have this tremendous power with a program when you, um, you know, when you execute it on different inputs, it gives you different outputs and you can control it when you write it. And so I think it's this uh, incredibly, it, it took me a semester to appreciate for, uh, and, and to, you know, to start the uh, appreciation I have for the task and the process of programming. I still study programming right now. I'm still enamored. I have students looking at programming, um, you know, in terms of understanding what uh, systems in the brain are being used when you read a program. You know, I look at uh, the modeling of code. Um, and of course, I use genetic programming, which is like this amazing way of, you know, hopefully automatically programming it one, one day. Nice, nice story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing with us. <laughs> well, as I said in the beginning, you were one of the founders of the Species Society. Mm -hmm. So we have seen his, his, its a history from the beginning. And how do you think that in, during this time, the Species Society has contributed to the evolutionary computing field? I am so pleased that Species was formed. I think that, that, that we also have to recognize that was, there was a lot of people who were essentially doing the work of the species organization for a decade, at least before that. Um, and to have it come together, it gave uh, uh, an identity to an alternate community to the ACM Sigivo community. Um, it's one that sort of has a real European stamp on it. Um, and it's filled, you know, it's, it's, it's run by dedicated uh, volunteers who understand the field well, and uh, really uh, have the field's best interests uh, uh, going forward. Um, and and what, I, what I love is EuroGP and EvoStar. They're wonderful events. And I hope one day to actually um, teach at a, some sort of uh, species summer school um, and interact more with uh, species association students. Nice, nice. I want to be, I, I, I wish that it will be in the next a few years so I can be a student in this, in that course. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my students went to the Species Summer School this year and nice. loved it. He really nice. had a great experience. Imagine. Yeah, I highly yeah. recommend it for any students out there. Yeah, I think it was really nice. Okay, nice. And in 2013, you started the Human at Gecko Group. Which were uh, your motivations? Well, um, there's challenges to being underrepresented in a scientific community. There's also some benefits. Uh, one stands out, there's no doubt. But there's tremendous challenges being a woman in a field which is dominated by men. Um, uh, everything from social situations to um, the informal networking and mentorship that is sometimes uh, less um, equitable across uh, underrepresented groups versus rep well represented groups. Um, so I always had my mind on doing such a meeting. And I have to say, um, it's one of the um, leaders of the species uh, organization, Anna Estancia, who um, persuaded me to do this. And I, and I sometimes look back and say, why didn't I do it earlier? Um, and I think the reason I didn't do it earlier was I lacked the confidence to lead. Um, and what happened was around that time, just the year before, I actually won an award uh, from, I won an award in Europe um, at the EuroGP EvoStar um, conference for contributions. And that gave me this confidence, uh, which I, I should, probably should have had without, with or without the award, but th th that award, uh, the timing, and Anna saying, come on, let's do this, let's do this, let's come on, you gotta do this. And then uh, it was like this joy to take up uh, the role of saying, well, how am I gonna make this happen? And, you know, I had fun with my children who are, who are girls, I have daughters. Um, and other women in the community, you know, thinking of the ideas for what we would do, we, we, we made pink t-shirts and everyone wanted a pink t-shirt. 
um, after we took them to Gecko that year. And uh, it has been such a fulfilling uh, organizational role uh, that I, I wish I'd done it earlier. Um, and from the beginning, it's so clear that women at Gecko enjoy it. And, I, and what I've enjoyed as well is over time, we've come to realize that it's not really women at Gecko, it's underrepresented people at Gecko who are really need to be welcomed and, and can really benefit from this kind of special event. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it um, really becoming more diverse and inclusive um, and rec you know, welcoming not just underrepresented minorities, but all the people who support them and who um, want to mentor them. Nice, yeah. This is of course a, a big problem in our society with the, with the majority voting because the minorities will never be represented. So we, they, they really need some, some strength, some force, some um, voice. Yeah, it's it's really nice. Have you seen any progress in this situation since then? Well, I think one of the um, factors, one of the ways you can measure progress is how inclusive we've become and how diverse we've become. And I think this expansion to understanding that, you know, um, it could be people who are um, non-binary who are welcome, um, you know, welcoming people from all over the world uh, doing it online for the two years that Gecko didn't meet in person. Um, so I do see an evolution of the group, and I think it's in a positive direction. Um, and I see a lot more, I don't see a lot more, but I see the rise of women in evolutionary computation, and I'm so proud of every single woman who has, um, or underrepresented person who has made their way through the community. I'm proud of my community for supporting them and mentoring them, um, whether informally or formally, you know, being inspirations to uh, uh, to people. Um, I, I find I've had very positive experiences in the community. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I think we are making progress. I, but I think it's always wise to um, evaluate and see how newcomers are feeling and uh, figure out that we're still charting the best direction for it. Nice. And do you think that this situation in the, for the minorities or the women in the field of uh, evolutionary computing is different from other fields in science, science or in society in general? Uh, that's a great question. I, I'm not, I, I would not claim to be an expert to be able to answer it accurately, more than to say, yes, all over computer science, women have problems with representation, um, not just in evolutionary computation. And I think all over science, women have, you know, not just computer science, but then if we expand that to, to science, uh, there, there becomes a problem with representation, particularly um, as women need to move up the ladder. And I think that speaks to still society not making all the adjustments necessary for um, allowing women to have a, an ideal work-life balance, um, which may change, that the balance point would change throughout their careers. So I think that uh, the, the problems or the challenges that women and underrepresented people at Gecko face, I think they're similar to the problems in uh, similar groups facing computer science and in science. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and obviously across yeah. societies and different across the globe, there's all sorts of different circumstances there. Yeah, okay, yeah. Of, of course, this group will uh, reverberate its uh, results and uh, in time, it will be a better, <laughs> we will have a better situation in our community because there are people in this direction, doing something, trying to talk and change it, things. So it's how things work, right? It's not just yeah. a speech thing. You have to, as you said, yeah. like you had this in a, you had this idea, but then you started it uh, in 2013. So it's it's necessary to have this movement, and then it, and then things happen. Well, and you know, there was one year you may not know, but Gecko in Madrid every track chair and the program chair and the editor-in-chief were women. 
Okay. We had the resources to fill all those positions, the women. And that's, you know, that's fabulous. What an amazing um, milestone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm very proud of the conference chair that year. It was Anna. Mm. Arthur Alcazar, you know, she, nice. she, she showed up. Yes. Every time. It could be done. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And well, uh, is uh, there any trend in the evolutionary computing field that you uh, are excited, excited about or some research topic that you think that's important for the future of our field? Uh, I think, I think coevolution is super important. <laughs> uh, maybe because I've been so involved in it, but I think it adds a layer of complexity. It adds a layer of dynamics. Um, I'm excited by so many directions. What I love going, love doing is going to Gecko every summer and trying to pick up on those themes and directions that are new, where new territory is being charted. And I see it in theory with new theory techniques. And I've, I've recently started um, collaborating with a theoretician, which I haven't done in years. And it's just so nice to see the progress there. Um, I think there's some exciting progress in theory. Um, I think there's some really exciting progress in genetic programming um, brought about by thinking about automatic programming um, and learning to program. And, uh, you know, uh, what I've noticed a trend of is that as a field, we're getting more and more recognition of the um, capabilities of evolutionary computation. Um, uh, in in coordination with their fields so seeing evolutionary computation papers and work and methods being cited inside uh communities papers and communities like uh machine learning and neurops that's really exciting yeah yeah these are really nice topics and uh, of course the evolutionary computing is is important <laughs> it's it is it is um you know i think about learning all the time and so often we jump to this idea that learning is something that we do in our lifetime. But really, species have learned um, over time. And uh, uh, recognizing that sort of macroscopic learning taking place on this evolutionary time scale, um, anyone who doesn't recognize it isn't, isn't actually um, opening themselves to a broader and more accurate notion of what learning is. Okay, nice. Well, would you like to um, add any comment and um, uh, final uh, thoughts? And <laughs> well, my final thoughts are, you know, is, is that uh, someone said to me recently that as you get older in a field, you know, you understand that research and a research career is not a sprint, um, but it's not even a marathon. What it is, is a relay race. And as I come to towards the later stages of my career, and I even think about what I would do if I didn't do research in evolutionary computation, which I've done for like 25 years or more, um, I think um, I value who's picking up the baton and running with it in evolutionary computation. Yes. And so I just, if I had a chance, I would send out my um, respect and my gratitude and my, and I would try and communicate my excitement to all the students out there of evolutionary computation and wish them the best of luck uh, with their journey forward. Nice, nice. Deep and beautiful thought because it's this uh, uh, feeling that we have uh, the community with who is working right now, but also with who worked before and will work later. So in time also, not, not also space, but, and yes, we, I totally agree. I think that we should always remember that if we could learn or execute something is because someone before us had done something, worked hard, and then we could start from, from some point and really. Nice.
I imagine that if I had been the PhD student doing this when I was a PhD student, you know, years ago, I would be interviewing David Goldberg, or I would be interviewing <laughs> John Koza, or Eric Wickman, <laughs> or, you know, um, all these great people who, uh, Stephanie Forrest, Melanie Mitchell, <laughs> you know, all these um, people who I was really fortunate to interact with as a young yeah. um, student and junior researcher. And um, yeah, I, I didn't understand how they looked at me. And so I said, okay, you're the future. And <laughs> I, we, we want to propel you forward with as much support and enthusiasm as possible. And I now I feel the same way about people coming up who are, who are <laughs> in that situation. Nice. Thank you for this uh, really pleasure time and this nice and interview, interesting interview. Um, and it's been my pleasure. Um, I hope to see everyone at your AGP this year. <laughs> yeah. Any poster. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.